Hello. Who cares about apathy? Well, I want you to continue to uh, be a part of this. So speaking to people who might be a part of an apathy club. Um, there's an obscure Cleveland Indians outfielder, obscure, now, obscure nowadays, but uh, back in the 1970s, he was popular among the fans, uh, even though he was only a part-timer. He was an outfielder, and he had a group uh, that would sit in the stands in the old Cleveland Municipal Stadium, and they were called John Lowenstein's Apathy Club. They called themselves back in the 1970s. And then after a little while, they, uh, Cleveland Indians traded John Lowenstein to the Baltimore Orioles, and he became a, a part-timer uh, there too, but uh, he became part of a World Series team. So that's kind of the frustration that Cleveland Indians fans had for a long, long time. But I'm speaking to people who may be apathetic. Maybe you don't care too much. Maybe you're like uh, that uh, young woman on the uh, Big Bang there. You said, not that anyone cares. Uh, she the one that uh, Raj and uh, Walowitz met in the uh, golf club with a friend of hers. Not that anyone cares, but um, please... I'd ask that you would please listen as long as possible, and I'm speaking to you right now, and preferably to the end, and uh, please care enough to like and subscribe. So there's a sociologist by the name of Will Herberg who passed away uh, a few years ago. Uh, I believe it's at least 20 years ago now, uh, but he had a saying that the typical American has developed a remarkable capacity for being serious about religion without taking religion seriously. And that does seem to be a real problem in our day and age here in the United States and in North America too. Um, where there's a real problem with religious shallowness, aimlessness, and apathy, where people show up, they hang out with their friends, and maybe, and maybe some of the message comes through, but a lot of it may just simply go by because uh, they're just paying more attention to what's on their phone or their friends or whatever. And this may be the problem with some of our young people, too. But it, for those who found the wonder and joy of salvation by faith in Jesus Christ, that gives you a strong motivation to overcome apathy in your life. There have been millions who uh, profess to be born again. They have evangelical beliefs, and we find them in our surveys. They have the words and the opinions of evangelical belief, but they have far less impact upon their families, the communities, the nation as a whole. And maybe it's a problem with apathy. Maybe it's a problem with being caught up in their own stuff. Maybe it's a question of priorities. But it is a way which breeds a lot of people who are nominal Christians, Sunday Christians, people who show up perhaps twice a, twice a month maybe. And... Uh, Problem of dead and shallow orthodoxy, having right opinions, but not having a real wholehearted commitment to Jesus Christ. And I'm talking about an obscure Cleveland outfielder. We're going to go into one of the most obscure books in the New Testament. There was a problem that arose with the Jews who returned to Jerusalem after a 70-year exile in Babylon. We do have a date for when this took place. The exile was God's punishment taken away from the Promised Land into Babylon, into what's now modern-day Iraq. They were taken away there and then returned. That exile was their punishment for years of idolatry and disobedience. But that restoration was itself a miracle. Deportations happen all the time in the ancient world. One uh, a group would rebel against the empire and they'd be deported and they'd usually within one or two generations assimilate. And when people talk about the ten lost tribes of Israel, that's really what um, historians say most likely happened. Um, it's, there's no real other possible explanation that uh, the ten lost tribes, the ten northern tribes, which were exiled around 722, that they were assimilated. So, but the Jews, the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Benjamin, and perhaps some people from Simeon and Nero as well, they returned to Jerusalem. They had an enthusiasm to go back to rebuild their city and their temple, but they slacked off their work when they encountered opposition, first from the nearby Samaritans, people who were up in Samaria, just a little bit north of them, north of Jerusalem, they encountered some opposition. So 520 B.C., the year 520, 
God had already waited for them to get up the nerve to do what he wanted done. But then, in his patience, he sent two messengers. One was Haggai, the other was Zechariah, who authored the next book in the Old Testament, and the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi. And you find these right before uh, the Gospel of Matthew. But uh, he sent a messenger, Haggai. He sent another messenger, Zechariah, and they both prophesied. So we're going to consider the part of the message that came from Haggai to rebuke them and bring them back to his work as a message from the God of the Bible that continues to address us today. Our apathy, our self-concern, if we claim to be his, but we live for ourselves in all the ages since then, this is his message to us. Haggai, chapter 1, verses 1 through 15. Well, what does this have? Yeah, we'll, we'll get into what this has to do with you here and now. So, in the second year of Darius the king, the great Persian emperor, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, pretty precise dating by ancient standards, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah. Yeah, the line of David. And uh, he was the governor there in Judah. And uh, to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, the Aaronic high priest, from the line of Aaron, the brother of Moses. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the Lord, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Consider your, now therefore, so thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, but harvested and harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them in a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? declares the Lord of hosts. Because of my house that lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore the heavens above you withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and on the hills, on the grain, on the new wine, the oil, and what the ground brings forth, on man and beast, and on all their labors. Wow. Haggai, God had something to say to these people through Haggai. Fifteen verses. So, first thing, God withholds his blessing from those who neglect obedience to him. And he will even go so far as to sabotage what it is that's distracting them from doing his will. He doesn't have to do much. He just has to withhold the blessing. And he does this to seek to direct them back to the way of blessing and following his direction. And that's a promise, a principle that we see from the God of the Bible for all ages. God rejects an attitude of self-concern that leads to neglect of following his expressed will. When he tells people what to do, his expectation is that they follow it. And the excuse of personal concern earns his contempt. He, is, he has very little sympathy for that, and it earns his rebuke and his correction. Verses 1-4 through four are the first prophecy that addressed to the whole people, the people there in Jerusalem, through their civil and spiritual leaders, speaking to Zerubbabel, the governor, the high priest, the religious leader. And these are two significant people in the book in uh, Ezra, uh, Nehemiah, um, Haggai, and uh, Zechariah. Yeah, these were significant people in that time. And if if you don't know, recognize their names, at some time you should. And uh, this is the day of special sacrifice at the place of the temple, according to this date. And he spoke to them, and all that there was at that time was an altar out there. There was no roof for the temple. The walls had been partially attempted, but un uncompleted. They were unfinished. And he could point around, all around it, and show that the temple was a ruin right there. It still remained a ruin. And People had excused themselves from completing the work which is there to be done. 
This house lies in ruins. This house around them lies in ruins. Pointed out to them. And that was simply, though, they're thinking that time had not yet come. Simply a rationalization for a me-first, self-concerned attitude, since nothing then delayed the work once the will came to do it. And uh, there's also a, some sarcasm in verse 2, where he talks about God calls them these people, not my people, but these people. Some bit of contempt there for the people there. Yeah, God wasn't too happy about what he was seeing happen there. So, the commonest excuses of not following the will of God are the same excuses we have today. The lukewarm come down to me and my own first, the attitude of self-concern. Apathy and neglect of the will of God, me first, self-concern. I got to get my own in hand first, taken care of. And they lead to neglect of the will of God. And when we neglect the will of God, God withdraws his presence and his blessing. But God won't leave his people alone in their apathy. Apathy may be, leave me alone, that attitude, but God's not going to do that. He may wait for repentance. He's a God, kind, loving, and patient. And in that time, he will send someone to rebuke them and call them back to what they've neglected. And we today don't have the temple in Jerusalem. The Dome of the Rock is on it right now. But in the New Testament, believers in Jesus Christ are individually and collectively the living temple of God now. And what the equivalent that we have now in our day and age is neglecting to grow in Christ individually in our lives. And as a church growing together in love and showing forth witness to show forth the glory of God among those who do not know Christ. That was the purpose of the temple back then, to show the glory of God. And that's even more the purpose of us as we are together, the living temple of God, individually, collectively as a church, the church worldwide, and the church universal, to show the glory of God among those who don't know Christ, by our witness and by our Christ-like lives. So, when we neglect that through apathy and self-concern, God doesn't leave us alone. Apathy and self-concern leads to God's sabotage of whatever distracts his people from his will. Attempts to put ourselves first, to get our own first, ahead of the will of God, will find that our highest expectations will be dashed because God simply isn't on the side of anyone who would like that. Verses 5 through 11, you see God calling the Jews in Jerusalem, called to build the temple. To make that ruin a temple. Consider the consequences of their apathy and their self-concern. First, verses 5 through uh, 5 and 6. Whatever they had never turned out to be enough because they were taking it home for themselves, not sparing what was there for God's purposes. Called them to do what was necessary to complete the temple. And they're taking it all home for themselves first. And uh, you look at this, especially at the end of verse 6, he who earns wages does so to put them in a bag with holes. Never enough. Yeah, that sounds an awful lot like inflation, doesn't it? So, and God was treating them entirely fa fairly. He's telling them to consider their waves, go and bring the wood in the hills and build the house he had uh the area was much more forested in those days so they just had to go up into the hills cut down the trees bring the wood down and build up the house so that god could take pleasure in it he wasn't going to give them anything but what they had already been called to do 
what they had agreed to do, and he had no obligation to bless their apathy and their self-concern, but rather he had the just obligation to his own holiness to withhold his blessing until they had devoted themselves, themselves to his purposes. Because they were his people. My people. These people, they, they should have been my people. His purpose was to restore the temple there in Jerusalem as a place devoted to the glory of the one true God, to be a witness to the nations. And he wasn't didn't bring them there just to provide them uh, a place to indulge their apathy, to indulge their self-concern, to have a little house of their own back there in the promised land where they could pursue their own peace, prosperity, and comfort without any regard to what he wanted, what he had called them to do, without any regard to showing forth his witness and his glory around them. And this is what happens also for believers in Christ who find themselves caught up in self-concern and apathy. They may find themselves on a terrible treadmill, a frustration, until they turn to the will of God that they've neglected. There may not be a turning to scandalous sins, but simply not caring anymore, not caring enough and neglecting what God had called them to do. Giving up when some things may have seemed to be getting rough. I'm getting tired, so let's just quit. And as Chuck Col uh, Swindoll once put it in one of his sermons, or someone disapprove, what are you doing? But the fear of man, desire for personal comfort and prosperity have often been linked in the hearts of the lukewarm. Personal comfort and prosperity instead of the will of God first. And this is one reason why we go in the New Testament. Jesus strongly warned against greed. He and Paul warned against the love of money and possessions. Those things which would not only turn our love away from God, but stifle our witness. Not that those things are wrong in themselves, but they're wrong when they become their priorities and become idolatry when they come before God. Charles Colson, uh, it's been about 50 years ago today, I believe, I've seen, that, seen it on uh, Facebook, that he came to know Christ, saving faith in Christ. He had been one of the Watergate, uh, involved in Watergate. He went to prison for that, for his part in that. And you can read his book, uh, Born Again, it's still available, which he taught and gives his testimony. And he talks about the lesson that he had learned about self-concern the emptiness and the frustration of his attempts at personal power and security. Through his time in prison and the truth of God, he said, All my life I sought wealth, success, and fame because they were the way, or so I thought, to security and power. I was influenced, like most children of the Great Depression, by memories of bread lines and parents worrying whether there'd be enough money for food and rent. And yeah, with inflation, a lot of families are bankrupt there right now, aren't they? The vision of the American dream drove this immigrant's grandson, and I believe with determination and hard work I could make it to the top. Yeah, yeah, that's what uh, that's what we're told. Determination, hard work, it's called, uh, um, called getting on your grind right now. Money and property were the keys to the kingdom where I could lock the door against want, fear, and insecurity and also against the presence of a loving God and his blessing. And this often leads more to frustration. And if God wants to bring us out of that, he's going to. So he wants to bring us out of a treadmill of frustration that this leads to as we realize the deadliness of our frustration as we realize the deadliness of our high expectations which aren't met because we've taken a, a direction independent of God and it puts us in a position where God must withdraw his presence and his blessing and our expectations often fail but there's no reason it's utterly unreasonable for anyone who does this to have any bitterness or disappointing in God because he's acted entirely fair, fairly. He owes us 
nothing. That's what grace is all about. He owes us nothing, but he gives us everything. And most of all, himself. So, God will not only be fair in his application to discipline and patient as he waits for repentance, but even more, he is willing to return to fellowship with people and restore his blessing when they take up what they've neglected. God restores his blessing when his people return to the way of obedience. We're going to see this in the next few verses. For whatever purpose he calls his people to accomplish, he is ready to be there. For whatever purpose there, to, with all his help. And the realization is that God is for his people, he is with them. It's great encouragement for them to put, his heart, put their hearts into the task which he's given us, the assignments which he's given us. The proper response to the rebuke and discipline of God is to return to obedience. The consideration of the glaring omission of what God has said must be done shows us the next step to take. Take up obedience. Take up the obedience which God has said, which he has set before you. We'll find, as we go on, in verse 12, Zerubbabel, Joshua, the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, the words of Haggai the prophet. That's a real contrast, a new attitude, a real contrast to the utter hardness of heart before the, the destruction of Jerusalem which they had upon they returned and there was a unity of the leaders and the people yeah you look at the book of jeremiah that's very very different from the way the people acted before the exile and they had the right motivation they found it they had the right uh, will to complete the work from the fear of god rather than the fear of man and they took up obedience and the realization of the consequences of neglecting obedience to God means that there needs to be a new start way, start back on the path of obedience. It means, yeah, we're going to live as if God were real, according to the faith that we have professed. We say that we believe in God. We say that we trust in Him. But so often we don't live consistently with that. There's a time, a happily married young mother stood up to give a testimony on Sunday evening service in churches a number of years ago. She said how at one time she had been living a double life, drifting between church life and smoking uh, marijuana every day and sleeping with her neighbor, drugs and adultery. And she found that she was pregnant and scheduled an abortion. But then one night she came to the decision that she's going to live as if God were real and she really believed in Christ and she said I put my faith in the God of the Bible not the God I made up in my head I was still everything I never wanted to be pregnant alone deserted by family and rejected by the one I had loved yet for the first time in my life I was really peaceful because for the first time I was being obedient and then she found a new apartment, a Christian adoption agency, and parents for the little girl. She gave her pregnancy, the little girl, up to adoption. And then she continued on in her testimony. That's why I praise God this evening. I thought in the depths of despair that my life was ruined. Yeah, ruined like the house there in Jerusalem. Life in ruins, house in ruins, coming back to obedience to God. And, and she continued, I knew that I at least had to be obedient and taking responsibility for my sin. But today, because of that very despair and obedience, I have what I never thought I could, a godly husband and now a baby of our own. But what matters more than anything is what I have been searching for. So long, peace with God. So God is then entirely behind his people. When they set their direction back on the path of obedience, they'll have the encouragement and confidence that when whatever they do for God, God will be entirely for them. Continuing on to verses 13 through 15. Then Haggai, 
The messenger of the Lord spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 26th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. God promised his presence once they started to obey. He would again be their God, instead of withdrawing himself and his blessing. His promise and his presence brought the encouragement and effort necessary to get things organized, to begin to work anew until it was completed. And within three months, the blessing returned. The second temple was completed in that first installment right back then. And the second temple became the place, the basis, the center around the second temple as it became refurbished by Herod the Great. And that's where the Lord Jesus himself came during his earthly ministry and taught. And it became a continuing witness for the one true God of the world of paganism. So yeah, God's purpose. They went out to obey. They worked on it and the blessing returned. God's call for obedience is the promise of eventual success. And his call also carries with it the promise of his presence. And this is with us today. What does Jesus say at the end of the Great Commission where he tells us to go and make disciples of all nations? I am with you always, to the very end of the world. And this isn't just something that's there to encourage us if we get lonely. It's a promise of his helping presence and his power through the Holy Spirit to accomplish the work. It's the encouragement then, knowing that he is with us his presence to go forward for the Lord in our lives and the life of the fellowship of believers around us. I am with us and doing the work which he has told us. I am with you, declares the Lord. And people came and worked in the house of the Lord, the host their God, until the 24th day of the sixth month, about three months. And the way of obedience to God is a way of fellowship with God, working with him for the accomplishment of his purposes. And the way back from our distractions, from our mistaken attempts at personal security before the will of God, will mean taking up the neglected obedience that we've had. What God has told us to do, and we've failed to do, which we've neglected, which we thought we've had other things that are more important at the moment means returning to the life in the presence of God through Jesus Christ to where we're taking up his command and we can say I am with you and he is with us always to the very end of the world which he means until the work is completed often believers in Christ have gone through hard times like the Jews who returned to the promised land to Jerusalem and they often look to rebuild their own homes first instead of building themselves, their church fellowships, and they're reflecting the glory of God. And they often have a frustration that hits them as God seeks to turn them away from their wrong-headed priorities. The wrong priorities come from a short-sighted view of God, a failure to see that God is defender, God is provider. And so people, from that failure to see God as defender and provider, they come to a lack of trust in him. They don't trust him to do for his people what he has promised. If they go into his people, go in the path of his will. And often it comes down to also a lack of vision of what God wishes to accomplish in the world through the witness to his glory through his people. The people of God then, as now, in those circumstances, people now need to realize the wrong path they have taken and come back to trust in God for what he has promised for those who prepare themselves and their true fellowships as, as dwellings of his glory through Jesus Christ for a witness to his glory in the word. Let's go back verses 5 and 6. Again, you can see it right there. 5 and 6. I had a friend 
who she said that back in the 1970s, when Richard Nixon came on television and was talking about whipping inflation, the first price controls, I believe it was that address, she said that she picked up her Bible and these verses came up right away for her. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. He who earns wages does so to put them in a bag with holes. Is that what's happening right now? Have we neglected the will of God? Is that what's happening in our economy? I can say that I believe that over the passage of time, as people started to look back to follow God, they saw this reversed. But I wonder how much of the times of inflation that we experienced back in the 1970s, stagflation, 1970 or, uh, or so to um, the, the early 1980s. So is it possible we're under discipline ourselves as a people if we've neglected following God, if we've neglected obedience to God, if we look to build up our own nest instead of following God? So what do we do? If we've neglected obedience to God, there's a buildup, a sense of omission. Duties we've forsaken, promises to God we've forsaken and broken. It may not so much be a breaking of the most egregious don'ts as failure with what one has reneged on before God and man. All these broken promises and forsaken duties separate us from God and his blessing as much as anything which is egregiously outside his will. So, what about your dreams of comfort and security? Secure nest in this world. Are you earning your wages? And put them in a bag with holes so it's never enough. You don't have the security, the warmth, and, and your fill, so on. The earthly home is not to be an end in itself. Our secure nest. We're not to neglect the will of God for that. So, whatever dreams you have, make them start with the will of God through Jesus Christ. Make it your trust in God to provide. God is your provider. Not going off on your own way. What would I do? Well, not WWJD. What would Jesus do? But what, what am I doing in this situation? Are you putting God on the back burner? His promises in the back burner. Not trusting his promises to provide. Not putting your priorities right. So, whatever your dreams are also, give the attention to what is necessary to fulfill those dreams for God. For the basic foundation, being a faithful disciple to Jesus in that, not just simply having your own little comfortable corner, but letting God work in your life. So, letting him speak to you. Through his word, speak to him in prayer. Listen and speak for him in the fellowship of believers. To be his person. To speak and to be equipped for witness in this world. To speak for him in this world. Tie your dreams to his purpose for your life, for a ministry. He'll provide for reaching the world. For being a faithful believer and to reach out and minister to others. Well, whatever specific area of ministry and witness there might be that God has for you, which he spoke to you through his word, which he set up with his providence in whatever ways you've been given uh, abilities, talents, and gifts in whatever situation you may have advantages. There will be basic equipment and preparation there. God wants you to use that. Not just for your own benefit, what's in it for me, but what's in it for you to use in that situation to glorify God. All this preparation you may have done to be a sound citizen and earn your living in this, not looking to your own abilities, but trusting in God as your provider to work through his word, as God as your witness, as your power, to direct your life and saturate yourself in his word. 
Look for his word to come through you and leave, for you to live it out, for you to be saturated, for others to see the overflow. So if the, if the word gave a great green tint to your uh, skin, you'd look like the Incredible Hulk. Yeah, I had to put that in. But uh, so there's working him forth for your life, for a basic touch to reach others, to do what he's called you to do in this world. If you're earning wages to put them in a bag with holes right now, look to God as your provider. Look to any ways which you might have neglected his will. Come back to him now. I hope this has been helpful. I hope that you and pray. I pray right now that you would find any ways in your life which you may have neglected obedience. Come back to God. Come back to God. Have an apathy about your apathy. Have your concern, not for yourself, but to serve and love God. And he does say, all these things will be added unto you. So, not only Haggai, but go back to Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. God bless you. Thank you for your time and your attention.